I'm Heidi Hutner. I am Director of Sustainability Studies at Stony Brook University. And today I will be talking to you about stories of nuclear disaster with a particular emphasis on gender and mothers. And I'll be drawing on various aspects of this topic um, from history, which is a picture of women's strike for, strike for peace in the 1950s, um, science, some film, and a little bit of literature. And I'll be weaving together a picture about radiation, gender, and um, stories of nuclear disaster. Also, uh, interviews with people I've done in oral histories. So I'm going to be discussing the function of mothers and women in the domestic nuclear story based on interviews and work by various scientists I've spoken with and read about on radiation safety as well as some film and literary narratives and what roles they play, how the maternalist, feminist, and non-dominant voices of uh, these women um, and of activists but also mothers who are challenging dominant norms um, using images and tropes that we see in film, but also using them in real life. How these counter and challenge and disrupt the dominant masculinist pro-nuclear narratives. So my entrance into this, uh, this story um, that I'll, I'm going to be talking to you about and, and the idea of working with oral histories actually came uh, with two mothers who were good friends of my mother who after her passing told me that my mother was very involved with Women's Strike for Peace. And then I began to read about Women's Strike for Peace um, and I learned what, what, what happened in the 1950s. Um, so uh, in the 1950s there were numerous above ground nuclear bomb tests from uh, the Nevada test site. And scientists found that strontium-90 from those tests, there were hundreds of these tests, um, spread uh, across the U.S. and ended up in babies' milk um, and, and then, uh, and then to, into their teeth. And so thus, the baby tooth study. And the milk was breast milk, cow's milk, and it was, you know, this, this spread of fallout across the U.S. So mothers organized, and they began protesting, and they ascended uh, on, on, on a particular day in Washington, D.C., and they protested, and they, and they lobbied. Uh, it was called Women's Strike for Peace Lobbying Day, and they stopped um, above-ground nuclear bomb test, and, and they are sort of known for being at least largely responsible for the nuclear test ban treaty that was passed in 1963. So another piece of this, so this is, this is a kind of foundational piece for me, is the, the engagement of mothers and, and anti-nuclear activism. Another piece was in the 1950s, Alice Stewart, who um, was an epidemiologist at Oxford, uh, was trying to understand why there was this leukemia outbreak uh, in England. And she famously said, let's go ask the mothers, because they couldn't figure it out. And they went door to door knocking, and they asked mothers, what had they done differently? What had happened possibly during their pregnancies that would have led to um, to this leukemia problem. And she discovered that the, the common thread was that they had all had x-rays when they were pregnant. And so her science showed that a single x-ray to the womb caused that child after birth um, to be twice as likely to develop cancer as a child who did not have that exposure. Now her science, you know, she's a female scientist at a time when women really were having a hard time in science as we know, um, her science was denied and ignored. Um, there's other reasons potentially. Um, Pro-nuclear advocates perhaps didn't want this information, that was her contention, uh, to be made more publicly known. Um, but it was confirmed further scientists discovered the same problem and um, eventually by the 1980s um, we didn't, we don't, we no longer x-ray pregnant women. But there are still serious consequences to radiation. Um, you know, we know that in any area where there are disasters, children are going to be exposed to radiation and pregnant women will as well. The other thing that's really interesting is that th that exposure, uh, even, even to a, a woman's eggs, can harm that child and when it becomes a fetus and of course a child. So this, this is an ongoing problem. So she was poorly supported in her science and she continued to fight this issue. Also, she fought against the Hiroshima study on radiation. Um, she argues that it really is not correct. Um, so she continued in her kind of feminist battle against the dominant arguments regarding nuclear safety. I wrote a piece called Invisible Victims for Ms. Magazine on gender and radiation. So there's some other interesting findings about mothers and gender and radiation. Mary Olson from NEARS and Dr. Marjun uh, Makajani both found in looking at um, safety regulations with radiation that women are nearly twice as likely to contract cancer from the same exposure to radiation as men and the same statistics for their dying from that cancer. So nearly twice as likely, same exposure as an adult male. 
Children uh, much more likely to develop cancer from that exposure. Girl children nearly seven times, boys five times, and of course the younger the child the more vulnerable they are. Our current safety regulations and standards in the workplace and elsewhere are based upon a white male adult body. So in fact women are far more vulnerable in the workplace or into any radiation exposure. Children that much more and we are not holding that issue into account when looking at disaster situations. Um, so, there's a, so that's why Ms. picked this up. And, and it ties into the other issues of, uh, of Al Stewart's research being denied and also this sort of area in which women and, and children and fetuses are particularly vulnerable. Race is also an issue here. Um, as Michael Johnny points out, um, race is not accounted for at all in these studies. Okay, so there's another way in which um, gender plays into this nuclear story, and that's gender and activism, where women uh, tend to be the largest group involved with nuclear, anti-nuclear activism. They use metaphors of gender, they use metaphors of maternity, and they use maternalist activism in their practices. And that's something that Women's Strike for Peace deliberately did, right? So they, they're countering dominant culture by going as mothers to Washington, D.C., talking about milk, breast milk, and babies, something that was you know, pretty shocking at that time. Um, so next, um, I want to talk a little bit about the films in the 1950s. Issues of, of milk and children and motherhood and maternity and the crisis of nuclear is over and over depicted through a female body, through a mother's body, through a baby. So um, in, in five, it's this crisis around childbirth and um, this, this is actually a scene here where it's a birth scene and there's a lot of yelling and screaming going on and she finally gives birth and the whole story centers on will this baby survive post-apocalypse? The story takes place post-nuclear war. Um, and ultimately the baby dies and the breast milk that's implied is somehow poisoned um, and you're constantly hearing a baby crying and the crisis is constantly embodied in the female body and in the mother's body. Um, similarly in On the Beach, probably one of the more famous films, anti-nuclear films, uh, made in the late 1950s and very popularized. The book was also extremely popular. It very much centers around the crisis of the baby, the family, the nuclear family, and milk. She's here looking at a calendar because they know they only have a limited amount of time to live. But the question here in this film is also when would the next milk bottle be delivered? And there's the, the movie opens for First with, with, uh, with the submarine, but very quickly moves right to the home and the sounds of a baby crying and the making of baby milk. So the maternal is figuring here. Also, World, Flesh, and Devil, there's an interesting uh, issue about the last woman and who's going to get to have her implied, you know, how will we reproduce? Um, and in all of these, well, not, not so much in On the Beach, but in both Five and the World, the Flesh, and the Devil, there's a racial problem as well with reproduction. So that's the 50s. Moving forward, there's a big break, and some people always ask, you know, what happens to nuclear activism? What happens to film popular culture? What's happening with nuclear um, in the space between 1963 and mid-70s and 80s and onward? Um, well, I actually asked some of the people I interviewed for Women's Strike for Peace, and they said, well, we thought we'd solved everything. We stopped above-ground bomb testing, um, so, and we turned our attention, because these were peace activists, to the Vietnam War. And with the end of the Vietnam War, now they're concerned again. And they're concerned about nuclear power, and they're concerned about nuclear weapons, and they're concerned about nuclear waste and disaster. And we all know, of course, Three Mile Island uh, happened in this time, and soon after that, um, the disaster at Chernobyl. Key figures in, this, in the anti-nuclear movement in the 80s were Petra Kelly. She uh, was co-founder of the, the Green Party in Germany. And much of her work um, was feminist, um, we could say eco-feminist, and she was very very anti-nuclear. She saw it as very male, masculinist, saw the weaponry as incredibly um, patriarchal. Um, and Helen Caldicott, who is a physician from Australia, she's still there, and uh, she became very involved, gave up her work as a pediatrician, and became a leader for the anti-nuclear movement in the 80s and continues to this day. And her followers, many of them women, uh, founded WAND and other organizations very much centered around the maternal, the female. And so a wave of films in the 80s, which um, 
syndrome, the day after, Silkwood, uh, Testament, China Syndrome. These were major, major films at the time. Uh, two of these were shown on TV, Day After and Testament, um, and highly popular, China Syndrome was the first. Um, these three in particular all center around the maternal and the crisis of the nuclear taking place in the maternal. Um, in Testament, there's a focus on milk almost initially, um, and it's the mother's story. It's in her voice. She's telling what happens post-apocalypse. The Day After isn't only about women, but the the most profound words about the crisis of nuclear um, are spoken by a woman who can't give birth. She's in the hospital bed and the doctor's saying, you have to let go, you have to have this baby in the middle of this complete crisis, this post-apocalypse crisis. And um, she kind of speaks the prophetic language of we should have known, we shouldn't have let this happen, um, why would I let a baby come into this world? Um, and similarly, we have sort of the entire crisis played out of post-apocalypse in this mother story and in the domestic in Testament. Uh, China Syndrome, I think the counter voice there, uh, Jane Fonda plays the, the journalist who's really showing the dangers, exposing uh, the potential for a nuclear meltdown at the, at the power plant. And Silkwood is a mother and she has you know many, many moments. She, she's the one who actually exposes the story. She ends up dying in the end um, and she's caught as a mother between being an activist, being a good mother, um, and she speaks about the fact when she's contaminated that she can never give birth to healthy children, that she'll have monsters. So that's, again, uh, the, where the nuclear crisis is in, embodied in the female body and in the maternal body. Um, so now I'm going to turn to oral histories. What I've done um, after looking at these various film structures um, and, and how the, the, this story of the maternal and maternalist activism is playing out in film is talk to activists. <laughs> and um, so I, I did a lot of interviews post Fukushima, almost immediately after Fukushima with, with Japanese women. Uh, I heard Chiko Sato speak. Um, I've actually worked with some of these people directly, I marched with some of them, been on projects with them. Uh, these are, uh, this is a, a group uh, of women who are pro protesting in India uh, against a very large nuclear power plant they did not want to open called Kunda Kulam. This is Kristen Iverson, who is a writer and activist who works on Rocky Flats in Colorado on the former uh, nuclear weapons plant there where they made plutonium triggers. Um, I've met with many people uh, from Colorado and interviewed them. Uh, this is Leona Morgan, and she is a Diné Navajo activist. And um, these are women who are activists locally in New York um, by the uh, Indian point nuclear power plant. So in all of these stories, there's this kind of, um, there, there's, there's a common thread. Um, one, the Japanese activists are very well aware of Women's Strike for Peace, which I find very interesting. And they see this kind of empowerment in women taking action and so forth. Um, and they see that women can use metaphors of maternity in their activism. They themselves use metaphors of maternity. So in their protests, they'll, they'll use pregnancy. They'll speak openly. They'll have figures of pregnant women and radiation. They staged a protest in Japan that was the length of uh, of gestation deliberately. And then at the end of that, and I'll show you the photograph in a, in a minute, there was a sort of celebration of birth, of rebirth. Um, and in all of these cases, there's this real urgency to tell the, their story. They're very well aware that the dominant media th is not covering what's happening to families, to children, to mothers, to their immediate family members. They're, they feel that their experience of the nuclear disaster is not being told. Um, and they really, really want the public to know, both as a sense of warning, but also um, as a sense of needing to be heard. And the other piece is they're very well aware that not enough science is being done. So while the stories will come out from Japan, they feel that how accurate can it be when they're not seeing science, they're not seeing enough medical um, tracking of, of illness post Fukushima, for example. Um, and similar feelings in Colorado. There's a sense of helplessness. Where is the help? Where are the records? Who is doing the studies post disaster? And, and in each of these, there's that urgency urgency to tell. And so when I reached out to them to talk to them, they eagerly talked to me. They want me to get my stories out. They almost beg me to get the material published and well and warn the public. Um, they also, and they'll do also a lot of citizen activism. They've got, some of them have their own Geiger counters. They're keeping records. They're trying to do, you know, citizen science. Um, and they're also trying to connect with one another and unite um, globally. So, um, this is the, the 
the picture of the, the post um, gestation period multi month protest in front of a major area in, in Tokyo. Um, and they literally camp there for eight months, which is for the Japanese, the gestation period. I want to talk about sort of the, the metaphors around children and radiation. So, some of the, the first photographs that came out from Japan post Fukushima uh, were images of children and radiation and, and many mothers' um, headlines about that. Um, and you can see here these images of children children and radiation and this playground image, which is used in a lot of films, actually I think Children of Men, which is not specifically nuclear, uses that image as well. So I want to conclude by saying that this sense of, uh, of the maternal pervades um, both in, in the science, which is really interesting, um, and also in the popular culture. We, we see it in the films. We see it also in literature, So and this, this desire to tell the oral narrative. Um, and I just want to, I'm only going to touch on this very lightly, but in personal narratives like um, Terry Tempest Williams' Refuge, uh, Kristen Iverson's uh, book about Rocky Flats, Cecile Pineda's book about Fukushima, um, and also Suzanne Antonetta's book Toxic Body, um, and they're very personal narratives. Narratives um, and really counter to sort of dominant history, where they're both telling what happened. They are including factual information and science, but it's the personal story. It's the mother or the woman, and most of them are mothers, um, or there's a mothering tale in there. In particular, Refuge, she's not a mother, but it's about her mother's death. Um, mothering is very much woven into it. Um, and the final piece I want to say is one of the scientists that I work with is um, Dr. Tim Mousseau, who um, interestingly is finding in his current science, and so we, I talked about older science um, with, with epidemiology, but in his current science he is finding again radiation impacts. So he's seeing in birds and bats and butterflies um, really negative mutations that are particularly about gender. And um, he's seeing that girl, female bats um, and butterflies and uh, birds are having much more negative effects, dying more quickly, having uh, blindness issues, and so forth. So this, this gender thread sort of weaves throughout. The maternity thread weaves throughout. And um, this desire to tell a different story, to speak up, to, to break down sort of the, nor the, the primary normative uh, and, and, and the dominant message that nuclear is safe, that we need it, um, all those sort of things that we tend to, we tend to hear a lot um, in a traditional science classroom and in our, in our dominant uh, culture. So thank you.